Um, I have a question for you, T. Like, yes. you know, we can see the starting of this painting, which is interesting. Um, yes. That brush that you have there, is it supposed to emulate um, chalk or? Yes, um, I call this brush textured chalk. And what I like, to me, when I, what I like about a brush when I make a custom brush is that I can create areas that have a lot of unity, so that are kind of uniform, or I can create a brush stroke with it that have a lot of variety, so a bunch of little dots. So do you generally think, like when you're doing your custom brushes, do you generally think of them as... Um... Okay, I'm going to make this brush to emulate a certain kind of medium that you use, like oil paint or pastel or whatever. Or do you think in terms of like, um, I'm going to make this brush to emulate trees or, you know, tracks in the ground, you know, that kind of thing, like more specific to the, the thing that you're actually painting as opposed to the medium that you're painting with. The way I make my brush is that, um, to me, every texture is a balance between unity and variety. And my brush, I make them, I want to be able to paint solid stuff with it or really varied stuff. So I don't make my brush specifically to paint a specific texture. Sometimes I can, um, to me, a texture the way our brain sees a texture, it doesn't see, like, for example, right now I'm staring at a tree outside and I see all these little details on it, but it's too much for my brain to handle all these little things. So it seems to me like my brain just see that, oh, on this, this tree is dark and the snow behind is white. And on this tree, there's all these little variation, which my brain cannot handle every little piece of detail it just see them as a certain balance between variety and unity right right and but like sorry um but like when you're you know painting a tree are you you know and, and you pick the brush that you're going to use or you make the brush that you're going to use are you thinking of making a for example a leaf brush or are you thinking hey i'm going to make a pastel brush and then paint this tree in a medium that will feel like pastel. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. That's a thinking, good question. <laughs> are you thinking a little bit of both? Like, I'm going to make this pastel brush to make these leaves. Um, I don't know. That doesn't really make sense. <laughs> no, but I know what you mean. Um, my brush, they just... To me, the, the leaves or the bark on the tree is just variation and unity. So my brush, um, I want that, if I can get that from a brush, then I think I can paint any texture. I'm not like a crazy person on texture brush. Um, I like to mainly use the most normal brush in Photoshop. You remember the brush you're using in your uh, digital painting class? It's just um, the round brush. There's not even transfer on it. It's just the pen pressure. Yeah. That's mainly the brush I'm using because I like to be able to figure out the texture more with my mind than with the, the custom brush. I like it. I like it. Painting with the mind, not painting with the brush. Yeah, there's, and, there's some people who use like stamps as like brushes. So if they want to like make a whole city, they just... <laughs> make a stroke and then there's like a whole city so that, that's really cool yeah I, that's, that's total genius too mm -hmm. you know like uh david levy holy cow perfect example seeing him do you know like uh we're in dubai he's doing a demo and then justin fields comes in looks at the demo and goes wow he painted that in two hours and i was like no that's like his third fourth demo each demo took him like 15 20 minutes because he had <laughs> an array of uh, brushes that he would use as stamps in abstract ways, like abstract shapes and stuff like that. Like um, when you think about it, I don't know if you know this T, but there's certain curves in a car that will just say Toyota. 
right? And you can pretty much, you can make a curves set that is the Toyota curves set versus the Lamborghini curves set. I didn't know that. That's a really interesting. Right, so if you imagine this kind of converted into abstract shapes, so then mm -hmm. you have these ab abstract shapes where these shapes, this brush is more of a jet fighter plane, right? Mm -hmm. Where you can use it in different ways, rotate it and stuff like that to create an alien jet fighter plane. And then you can have another brush where the curves of that stamp, so to speak, is in uh, certain kind of curvatures that are good for something that's more like a, uh, I don't know, like a, like a hippie, you know, makeshift vehicle. Mm -hmm. right. That's really interesting. So there's, um, they make different brushes that feel like these different things. Yes. Yes, exactly. And, uh, it's not like it's a cutout version of a van. You know what I mean? It's more like here are some shapes. You put them together. You can rotate them around to create different kinds of van-like vehicles, right, with a certain kind of curvature to all the different curves. That would feel like Toyota style or Lamborghini style. Yeah, yeah. You know, I remember Paul Lazane in a Schoolism Live workshop he was saying that way back he used to do a lot of traditional painting and he had this one brush stroke. He could make this one brush stroke that would feel like a tree, <laughs> another one brush stroke that would feel like a building. See, that's the yeah. coolest thing about um, traditional painting though, right? Like y you give somebody the same exact brush as the one that you're using, mm -hmm. but also now the custom brush you know technique or whatever it is the skill of the custom brush is in the way that you use the brush not just like oh what kind of brush do you use go give me that brush i'm going to use it boom now i'm doing the same exact marks as you are mm -hmm. right with traditional you can't do that not really anyways right it's yeah. much harder like as opposed to digital you get some sort of downloaded brush and then all of a sudden you make a mark it looks just like that that other guy that you know they use the same brush so the brush i'm using right now it's kind of a brush that simulate chalk and i usually use this brush to do more uh, color studies or if i want to do a quick painting like that in an hour i like I... it it looks really cool now let me ask you and there's no um wrong answer here of course <laughs> like uh you know That's people download it download brushes and stuff like that now, did you make this brush or did you download it? I did make that brush. Right on. Right and on. I, I, I play, I tried, I tweaked it for so long that uh, I would not be able to remake it. <laughs> 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 but uh, I saved it in a bunch of places so I don't lose it. Right on, Just, man. Because I spend so much time with so much option that I never use and then give a brush stroke to see how it looks. And then uh, they give that. But then I did so much trial and error on it that I, I would not be able to retrace my steps. <laughs> but I like this brush, especially when I do color study because I can mix colors with it if I pass really lightly. Mm -hmm. It kind of mixed with the color underneath. And one thing I really like about it is if I dab with it, then I get a bunch of little dots. So I can make colors that don't even exist. For example, if if you look at the sky behind the on the painting, yeah. um, there's some pink and there's some blue. And in some spot, there's just dab. And it kind of mix in your eyes some kind of like an impressionistic painting. Yeah. So you cannot pick that one color because it's actually two colors side by side, bunch of little dots. So you can make colors that don't even exist in a way. Yeah, you know, like, um, I don't know if you know this one, a little fact for the audience. You know how when you, and you can see this in the older televisions even more, when you look like if you ever pressed up your face right up against the screen, like a little weirdo, like I did when I was a kid, you know, and look 
you can see the RGB there, right? You yeah, can see yeah. the red, green, and blue lights. Yes. Right? I've done that before, right? too. <laughs> see? Um, I knew curiosity. it. I'm like... Awesome. <laughs> I'm not the only weirdo. Yeah, so where does the yellow light come from? When you see a color yellow on the TV, it's not true yellow light, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The mind tricks you and will only show red. green and red actually make yellow, right? Okay. Like green light plus red light equals yellow light. Because, like, yellow is in between those two, right? Because when you're adding, yeah, when you're adding colors and it's in the form of light, the result is only going to get even brighter. Mm-hmm. So, so it, it, yellow only, is close to white? Yellow is close to white. If you mix uh, blue in with the green and red, then you got white light. Interesting. Right? So when you actually see a banana on the TV, <laughs> you're not looking at a banana. You're looking at a green and red banana, right? That the green and red lights are so close together that uh, the mind perceives it as a yellow color. And now now there's, you know, TVs I've heard. I don't have one of these new special TVs, but I've heard that uh, there are some TVs out there that do have an actual true yellow light. Maybe your fancy TV, because I know you got a fancy <laughs> new cool TV that looks realer than real. Maybe that actually shows. Uh, I'm going to go stare at it from super close <laughs> after this stream. And I'll let you know. I'll text you. Right on, right on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, um, that's that's something that I never learned in school. I don't know why they would never teach you that in art school. In art school? I learned that in film school. The RGB for the TV, kind of. Mm. But that was, like, film school, not in art school. Well, so far, we have been uh, on for 15 minutes just talking and stuff and haven't answered one question so how about we go to the first question the yeah, first question comes from marks everywhere and he says when's the good time to end a mentorship and uh, how can you maintain a good relationship with your mentor or mentors now uh, I would love to take a little stab at this one first of all I love how mark says when do you think would be a good time to end a mentorship, right? Because, yeah, they should, my own opinion is they should all end. As much as I would love for uh, Masay to be like my Padawan for like ever <laughs> and ever, I know that she will eventually need to find, you know, uh, new new mentors to learn from to keep expanding so she grows into her own uh, person. Which is why, you know, of course, we have you taking all the different schools and classes. Mm -hmm. So that's been awesome. By the way, how's that going? Oh, it's great. I love it so far. I'm taking Daniel Ariaga's class and Jonathan Hardesty's. Oh, both at the same time? Yep. It's, so it's, it's kind of like, it's not too much workload, but it's, you know, doable. And wow. I didn't, I didn't even know that. Yeah. That's awesome. When does uh, Daniel's class end? Um, it should be in, I have two more classes, so another two, two weeks left. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I got a question for you. So how much time do you think you should allocate for, like, the average uh, class? For each class, I would say, so when you watch the lessons, it's roughly going to take you anywhere from an hour, an hour and a half. And then um, what I personally like to do is I like to watch um, some of the critique videos before I start. And then, so that's an extra, depending on um, who, which instructor you have, they, they give you like different amount of critique. Um, so that's roughly anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. And then after that, I like to spread out my, the time I spend on my assignments throughout the week. So in total, that'll be roughly another, an hour, uh, maybe two, two, three hours. Because I want to, since I want to get the most out of it, and I'm gonna get one critique for that one, one lesson, then mm -hmm. I'm gonna put like my all into it. Right on. It's yeah. great having these streams because we get to catch up on like what you've been doing and <laughs> yeah. stuff as well. So that's that's great. Um, how long are the critiques usually? Like I know Jonathan 
artisty. He does a long critique. Oh right? yeah, but his is very, very like detailed. He goes like he answers every question with, um, yeah, a lot of detail. Um, Daniel's class, uh, his critiques are fifteen to twenty minutes. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it's really short, but um, he gets right to the point, and you can tell that he thought about everything before he started the critique, and he gives it like out to you like right in front of you, and then he's like, okay. Yeah, this is what I think. That's why Daniel's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just thinking back when, you know, when I was teaching at Sheridan College, mm -hmm. before you were there at Sheridan. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was very hard to find any time, a, a good amount of time, to go over a student's critique. You know, not just every class, but, like, even just, like, once a month, <laughs> you yeah. know? Because you got the lessons, you got multiple people. Okay, anyways... Um, T, what do you think about this question that I kind of just glazed over? <laughs> so, when is a good time to end a mentorship, and how can you maintain a good relationship with your mentors? Um, when is a good time? I don't. I think, I think you should always have mentorship. Uh, go from mentorship uh, to mentorship, and always have mentor your entire life. But you, you probably, the question is probably more specifically when to end each one of them so maybe he's asking that not so not to feel like he's letting his mentor down by leaving mm. so um you know i think it's the job of every mentor to let the students go when they're ready yeah um, that's difficult for a lot of mentors well it is hard like here at the workshop it's like breaks my heart every time every, every time oh, oh no. once the students leave you just crawl up in a ball and start crying you know what i do i pretend they're still here and they're sleeping oh that's and I'm hilarious like, i'm like lazy bastards they're still <laughs> sleeping it's five in the afternoon and they're still sleeping but i i mean um you know i said for me i I decide, I ask them to put their plane ticket back before they come. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because after they're here, I would just be like, yeah, you guys should stay. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it'd be way too hard. So I take care of all of this, yeah. uh, the dates they leave and stuff and that before I know them. Because yeah. then this way it's already set. And... You know, is here, you know, you could say 30 days is long, but at the same time, 30 days is really short. And I sure. feel it's like when for me after 30 days, it's time to let them go. But we keep in touch on Facebook. Uh, some of them, we text each other. And um, I think it's uh, on a case-to-case -case basis when is the good time to end a mentorship but to stay in touch i mean you know you're all friends and stuff like that and if if your teacher has a problem like if maybe it's a little ego thing if you don't i don't know i love my students and i don't want to let them go but they have to go and um maybe I, I'm not mad because they go, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's like, you keep in touch, like you, it can be when you travel, when you go to convention, Bobby, you see a lot of the, of the students. I do, the more and more too. every year, it's so cool. <laughs> Man. So that's a good way to stay in touch. Yeah, and... the people that have been through the in-house workshop have you know it like the population just grows every year at all the different <laughs> conventions and workshops and stuff it's pretty awesome it's really awesome like noah i could see noah on there hey noah how's it going good to see you noah's going to be joining um the schoolism crew in berlin in london and i believe stockholm. in stockholm yeah right you're going to stockholm yeah, right? I'll be, I say? yeah i'll be there yeah, Noah just finished the in-house workshop, and it wasn't. If it wasn't for the in-house workshop, then none of that would have even happened. So, um, one good way, which is exactly what she did, was she volunteered to like help out at a workshop, right? And um, and also came to visit us in Toronto, spend some time with us, uh, you know, just to hang out and everything. So, and this happens a lot, like 
Shwen, our wonderful friend Shwen Chen in uh, Singapore. She's going to be coming to Toronto to work at the Imaginism Studio uh, full time um, this year. So that's going to be great too. One kind of tip that I would just like to give Marks Everywhere is this morning I, I called a friend that I have no reason to call. It's just been way too long. And so first thing I say is, hey, how's it going? So and so, you know, I really don't I really don't have a reason for this call. I just wanted to call, you know, and sometimes that kind of an email, that kind of a call to your mentor is a really good thing. Um, other things is like just you could take there's almost like a different holiday every stinking month. Every holiday is a perfect opportunity to just email your mentor or whatever it is and tell her or him, you know, hi, how's it going? You know, just want to say hi. That's pretty cool. Thanks, buddy. How's it going to you? I don't have any reason to call you, but, uh, you know, I, let's do a stream. Let's just hang out. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's fun. I love doing this. It's just like a Skype call, you know? Totally. Now let's get to the next question because the next question is one that is really awesome. Mauricio asks, any chance of a live workshop in Mexico City? So uh, next week, Friday, I'm actually having a meeting. Part of that meeting is talking about Mexico, talking about Colombia, talking about Argentina, and perhaps Peru. Nice. Wow. You know, so who knows? Who knows? Uh, love to travel and you know while I'm at it why don't I just mention real quick the workshops that are coming up because they're exciting and they're starting to sell out Berlin's already sold out so first one is Montreal March 12th and 13th this is gonna be bigger than uh, last year's it's gonna have Daniel Ariega Chris Pern Louis Gonzalez Luke de uh Nathan Fox and my my homie Steven Silver Nice. And then we also have March. I'm going to be heading to Florence with Helen Mingju Chen, the amazing Helen Mingju Chen, and Ryan Lang, uh, powerhouse couple. It's going to be great. Hang out with them. Then there's Seattle, April, London, also in April, Berlin, also in April. Berlin is completely sold out. London is selling out and will sell out by the time we start. And uh, Seattle, it's happening. It's going to be great. First time at Emerald City. That's going to be super fun. And then, uh, of course, after that, Stockholm. So Stockholm, Steven Silver, Daniel Ariega. <laughs> Steven Silver, <laughs> Daniel Ariega, Shiung Kim. For the first time, Shiun Kim, that's going to be sick. This guy is such a crazy artist. And a nice guy. He's and a nice guy. So nice. Yeah. And Chris Pern, Sam Nielsen, and Eric Canetti for the first time from Riot Games League of Legends. Mm -hmm. That's going to happen end of May. Get on that one. Tickets are on sale for all of these. Stockholm, Montreal, Florence, Seattle, London, Berlin. And very soon, in the next couple weeks, we're going to start sales for uh, Schoolism Calgary and Schoolism Toronto. Now Toronto was the biggest workshop that we did all last year. It was incredible. And uh, you came down all the way from Quebec from you know your neck of the woods T. Yep. Dude that <laughs> one wasn't that one crazy epic? That was awesome. All the Schoolism live workshops I've been to were like unforgettable experience. And I think about them often. <laughs> I'm really excited for the Montreal one, which is happening really soon. Yeah, and that one's yeah. selling out really fast too. Mm-hmm. Can't wait yep. for that one. That one, uh, get to see a bunch of my buddies. Yes. And this, you know, each group of instructors kind of paints a different kind of personality almost. Probably <laughs> the same as like the students that come to the, the in-house workshop, right? Like you have your group that likes to party. Yeah. Or you have the group that likes, you know, to keep it clean and go to museums and all that stuff, which is very nice as well. 
You know what I find? I find every group I have develop a group personality. Right? Like, you know, there's stuff I like to do. For example, like, I can drink or I, I like to play poker, but I never play poker. You know what I mean? But if you go somewhere with a group and then you realize, like, oh, we all like to play poker. So then maybe we're going to play poker more. So certain parts of you in a group kind of surface more. Or if I like, if I'm with a group that I really like to drink, then I might, we're probably going to drink more than usually. Mm-hmm. Or if I'm a group that they don't drink at all, then I'm going to probably drink less than normally. So everyone in a group, it's probably what happens with the schoolism life teachers. Brandon's uh, talking some smack to you in the chat there, buddy. <laughs> what Brandon is he saying? just finished the in-house workshop. He said he took your money in poker. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> I, I guess he doesn't understand that, uh, you know, you let him, you let the students win. That's part of it. Right? <laughs> just joking. So should I talk smack back or just let this go? No, I don't, I don't know. I'm not, you know, like that... <laughs> To me, I'm already, like, rubbing my knees because, like, it's kind of like, you know, man, I get into talking smack sometimes <laughs> and it goes on and on, especially with you. Especially yeah, with you I don't know why. Why me? I'm so... I don't I'm know, so... man. I don't know. I don't know why. I think we Remem- just hang out too much and it just, like, you know... I guess that's what good friends are. Remember <laughs> when you came here, when you guys came here and we played the exploding kitty game? Oh, yeah. yeah. That was fun. It was becoming personal. Yeah, I got to see a different side of Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. And Kay, she was just like, man, you you really can't control yourself when it comes to competitive games. <laughs> and that's totally why I do not like but competitive, you... uh, to have a competitive way of thinking. Mm-hmm. You know, I really feel like how we have pushed so much of society towards competitive thinking you know who's gonna win the super bowl who's going to be the world champion who's you know like any kind of situation like that generally we're all gonna be losers at some point you know if success is based off of whether or not you are a champion which by the way you lost before me and exploding kittens um (laughs) You know, you shouldn't feel bad about yourself because of that, you know? I don't remember that. Of course not. That's the way to go. (laughs) Forget it all and tell the next group of students that you were much better than me. That's good. I think Uh, that's a good practice. Let's go on to the next question. (laughs) That Bobby, that side of Bobby was starting to come out. (laughs) Let's go on to the next question. So the next question says, uh, I was trying to figure out what to work with. Uh, the best I could think so far is that I want to make people think with my work. Any ideas? Don't know where to start. I like biz dev, comics, etc. Okay, Andre. So, um, one thing that I've thought long and hard about, uh, for the last few years is just kind of like the different levels of art. Okay. So first level is kind of like understanding how the world works, how we see things, stuff like that, basic fundamentals. And then you start learning other fundamentals that are a little less basic, like the anatomy of a fish, the fundamental anatomies, anatomy of a fish, right? And then you can play around with those things, the anatomy of, uh, you know, a dog and so on and so forth relates to, you know, a a fox and whatever else. now when you get that under your belt or perhaps you just move on another level is kind of like the the emotional impact that you want somebody to feel from your piece of art and notice like these are so general that you can apply these to storyboard to character design to background to whatever and then the the next one above that is when you can really con- kind of construct uh, an experience to convey an emotion when people are looking at your art. The next level above that is art that changes people. 
right? Like when I saw Ratatouille for the first time, weren't you affected, right? Oh, that movie was so <laughs> affected. You're like, yeah. yeah, I could do it. Brad yeah. Bird says I could do it. <laughs> I believe that. You know, it really changes you. And that is the highest level of art. So what do you, where should you start? You can really do this with any aspect of art, you know, whether it's viz dev or comic books or whatever. Comic books, you know, I know have affected so many people there, especially like when you go to like San Diego Comic Con or something like that, you look outside and you remember this tea, you might see a whole fleet of, yeah. um, of those little like motorized uh, you know moped things for people that are handicapped I don't know I can't think of the word right now what are they called you know, know what I'm talking like, about like, like a they're scooter, on a scooter. they're on thing? like a scooter and there's a literal fleet of them right and you could tell by the people that read comic books and stuff a lot of them were completely inspired and changed by the stories you know, mm -hmm. especially, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of people that take to comic books and stories that might be going through a lot of difficulties. And that's awesome. So awesome. I don't know if it, anybody wants to add anything to that. It's like Star Wars, you know? Star Wars. is a movie oh. from the 70s. Yoda. And it's like, it's got so much impact on so many people. Yoda had such an impact. That's probably <laughs> like the character design that had the most impact on people's lives. <laughs> He's you know? the ultimate old master. Definitely. Because like his character even talked about philosophy. It's so awesome. Um, you know, Bobby? Yeah. When I was a kid, I was going to see my dad on the weekends. And every time we were renting movies, I was renting the first two Star Wars. And I remember when the third one came out, I think I was eight years old. He took me to the theater, and I still remember. I remember the exact moment we showed up at the theater. I remember we showed up late. I remember exactly what was on screen when we walked in. Is that funny? It's such, such a big impact on so many people's lives. Oh, totally, totally. That might be the experience that you had uh, watching a movie with your dad, though. It might be more about, like, being with your dad, though. And it just happened to be Star Wars. Yeah, and it just happened to be Star Wars. Because, um, <laughs> like, one of my most memorable uh, and happiest experiences, you know, watching a movie was actually Karate Kid Part 2. Oh, was yeah, it with your like, dad? Have you watched Karate Kid Part 2? You probably don't remember much of it. I don't think I remember much of it. I remember the little drums thing that the person would like, all the crowd was like turning in the end. Mm -hmm. No spoilers, I'm sorry. It's like 40 <laughs> years old or something. Damn it. I didn't spoil it for anybody, damn it. <laughs> uh, if you didn't watch it, it's probably because you're never going to watch it, and I don't blame you. But um, yeah, it's because I was at school, my brother came into class, and said to the teacher uh my mom has really important business needs to take me out of class and i was thinking i was in a lot of crap because i was in, in trouble causing crap yeah i was always <laughs> causing trouble so i just assumed i was in trouble and i did i was just thinking which one of the bad things that i did recently <laughs> did she find out about <laughs> and i got into the car and she said oh yeah we're you know, we're going to take you to the movies. And then, ben, you know, my brother started laughing or whatever. And, you know, obviously I wasn't in trouble. I was actually, my mom picked me up to play hooky. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's already awesome. But I, you know, I come from parents that would never, ever tell me to play hooky, ever. And this was the one and only time. So even though the movie was pretty bad. <laughs> It was still one of my most memorable experiences. It's awesome. Anyways, um, yeah, let's go on to the next question here. So the next question says, Mauricio says, any chance of a live workshop in Mexico City? Oh, I just said that. So yeah, <laughs> would love to come. No plans yet, but 
the lookout. Okay, Nakio, what up, Nakio? Hey. So Nakio asks, uh, when you start a painting, a painting such as this one, do you have a story in mind, or does the story evolve as you paint? Yeah, I want to know that too, because you know, in the beginning, it's like, it, it's just abstract stuff almost at first, right? Did you have any idea that there's going to be a goldfish and all this other stuff? Yeah. Before? I kind of knew what I wanted in my head, and I kind of, uh, I like, I took reference for it. So the landscape that you see is actually in the backyard. It's the backyard of the, it's actually a lake. It's the lake in the backyard of the Imagism, in the Schoolism house at the Imagism workshop. It's and totally I thought, reminded me. yeah, me too. We were yeah, that, that's exactly it. there. Yeah. Cool. And I was like, you know, it'd be cool if there'd be some giant fish there. That's pretty cool. Mm. Yeah, I. you know what? That's why uh, I really like this painting, this concept, because it really speaks about you and your <laughs> life and stuff. And that's totally like the things that really gravitates me towards certain parts of art. Cool. It's like there's so many cool landscape here. I take a whole bunch of pictures and uh, sometimes I imagine stuff in it, just like this big fish. And that uh, lake, it was really fun for me to paint too when I was down there. Yes. So the painting didn't turn out so hot. Uh, it's just too cold. It's way too cold outside. My goodness. <laughs> um, so let's go on to the next question here. Monica asks, uh, Bobby has an awesome and simple signature. Right on. It takes me back to childhood when everyone filled hundreds of pages of their future celebrity signature. <laughs> How did your signature develop, Bobby? Wow, that one's a really good one because I actually... Well, I, I totally remember practicing my signature in class. This is back to grade six when I first had, you know, started developing my signature. Yeah. And uh, my signature at that time, it would say Bob Chu, and then the O in the Bob would, I would draw it into a little basketball. And then I would draw a little Jordan <laughs> dunking, you know, <laughs> doing the Jordan dunk with the legs spread apart and uh, jamming the ball. And it would take me forever to <laughs> write one damn signature. Oh my so God. that had to go. Could you imagine <laughs> signing all the art books that you need to sign? It's like, yeah, oh, totally. your hands would get like, so tired. Actually, I have to thank uh, Bill Pressing because Bill Pressing has such a beautiful signature. I don't know if you... oh. he has some pieces here somewhere. But um, yeah, his signature is beautiful, mm -mm. articulate. And I was like, I don't want that. Because, like, that looks like it takes a super long time. And uh, I also talked to some other artists when they're signing, uh, you know, doing their signings for signed copies of their art book. And they're like, yeah, it took me the whole day to sign a thousand copies. And I was mm -hmm. like, no, that's not happening for me either. So uh, my signature really developed through the idea that I wanted to be quick. Yeah. Yeah. Another option would be stamps. I know some artists they use stamps. Yeah. That's pretty cool, like custom made and like you know carved and. Stuff. Yeah, and then you would like uh, have it in your will when you die that your stamp be destroyed and buried with you. Oh really? I don't know. I saw it on uh, Da Vinci Code or something like that. The second one. Yeah. Angels and demons. Uh, I guess that makes sense though. So with no the, one else can like use yeah, your signature. The Pope's stamp gets a big like cross in it, like. Uh, you know, to break it pretty much. Oh, okay. Cool. Not that you need to do that, but yeah. it, it might be, cool. <laughs> might be fun. Um, but yeah, then you don't actually know if that artist stamped it, though. Yeah, that's true. You could have had, you know, like Frank Sinatra, most of his signatures are by his assistants or whatever. What? Yeah, really? yeah. Oh. Tons, tons. And it's very seldom that you actually see a real Frank Sinatra signature. Oh, wow. All these random useless facts that are crawling into my head. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
let's go on to the next question because that one was a pretty simple one. So the next question says, Marina asks, uh, do you do something specific to have more control over the shapes you are creating when when using the free lasso tool? Right on. Good question. Um, I don't I don't know if you saw what I was doing in the beginning when I was drawing the tree and stuff. I yeah. treat the lasso tool a little bit like a, a pen. So I actually draw stuff with it. I doodle stuff with it. And then when I close the shape, sometimes there's gaps that I need to reselect but i try to actually draw stuff with it not think about oh my god i'm using a lasso tool i gotta be very careful but right. i'm using the lasso tool like a like pencil sketching almost yeah i'm sketching with the lasso tool yeah so it's not like you know like uh when you clean up a drawing totally not right. i'm just You're i'm just like sketching it i grab the lasso tool and then i sketch a fish and then after that, you can press Alt to subtract part or Shift to add some part. If I'm like, you know what, I miss a little thing there. So if you, after, if you would scroll back to the beginning of the video, if you guys rewatch this later, you can see when I did the, the eye shape at the bottom, the trees and the fish, I'm act and the, even the, like everything in it that I use the lasso tool for, I'm I'm sketching with the lasso tool. Yeah, and actually, you know, um, Dyson Robert, they kind of do the same thing. Theirs is a bit more kind of used precisely, right? Mm -hmm. Like they will redo the lasso tool a couple times to find the exact curve and things that they want. Um, and that was really great to see, but I actually started adopting your method as well after watching your videos. So thank you. <laughs> um, let's go on to the next question. So the next question says, next question says, have you ever felt overwhelmed by everything you still have to learn? Uh, yeah, yeah, but you get used to it. Yeah. <laughs> I think you it's just... You kind of have to accept the fact that there's just a lot of stuff to learn, but you mm -hmm. have to take it step by step. And you really can't learn everything, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, I try to just concentrate on the overall goal, which is to have an overall successful career, an overall, you know, career where you're constantly learning. So you try. I try not to think about you know everything that I could possibly learn in art. I just concentrate on the things that I'm learning at that point. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm and you know, being overwhelmed by stuff is not necessarily bad. Like when I, I always try to take projects that terrifies me. <laughs> so you, it's true, because then you're like. I need to step it up and I need to get better. And then you go through it and you try really hard and you keep going and going. And then by the end of it, you're a different person. And same when I try to learn class, sometimes uh, the schoolism class I take, I'm like, oh. wow, there's like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. So when John Hardesty came here, um, he was going to do a demo with oil painting and I, I, I sat with him and I, I painted with oil as well. And I know like it was overwhelming. I didn't know what I would do, how I would do that, but you just do it. And mainly where I learned that, well, I learned that from art and stuff like that. But um, when I do CrossFit, it's like every day the workout is like, there's no way I can do that. Mm -hmm. And then by the end of it, you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. Mm -hmm. So you get used to that feeling of taking a challenge that you're like, that seems undoable, but you just uh, jump on it and just like fight through it until you succeed. Yeah, so totally. And you know, if I could add one more thing, it's just like, Take it this way, everybody. You don't have a choice. <laughs> you know, once yeah. you go, hey, you know what? Yeah, I don't have a choice. Then you'll stop asking yourself, oh, should I work out today? Oh, should I practice my stuff today? Oh, should I do my schoolism class today? 
you're just gonna do it you know get used to that like you know when one of the hardest things about starting you know our own studio and everything was that nobody's telling us what to do anymore so it's like you have all these options and you could do a little bit of everything get nothing done or you could put on blinders and actually you would get more stuff done when you you know keep yourself from doing a lot of things mm -hmm. right on um let's go to the next question here which is yuri asks not a technical question but how do you manage personal problems while you must work and study and this one man you know you, let's first say that you are normal and most people go through a lot of stuff because life you know there's ups and downs but um one thing to that really helps me and you know to kind of visualize and everything is and I got this from Headspace. I'm not making this up. Uh, Headspace is this meditation app that uh, I've used before. And one thing that they say in there that really struck me was um, if you kind of imagine all the crappy things in your life as these clouds that float around in your head, know that the blue sky is always behind there and the clouds will always dissipate at some point you just gotta wait for it <laughs> it's beautiful bobby i, I got a little it. tear i loved <laughs> it and you know i'm not taking credit for this one this one is totally headspace I'm not affiliated with them but i would recommend it it's pretty awesome um next question here and well actually you know it'd be great to hear if you guys have anything to Put in like you know when you're dealing with how do you manage personal problems while you must work or you must do study mm. like Masay, you're always a happy person i know shit happens to you <laughs> sometimes how do yeah. you deal with it oh uh, i don't know i don't know how i deal with it i kind of just you're just naturally happy <laughs> i try to be that's um, awesome yeah, there's all like what you said. There's always like the brighter side of things. Like the the weather will clear up eventually. It just you just have to wait. Yeah, not totally. Mm -hmm. What about you, T? Um, I, I guess I just deal with stuff. Like if I got a personal problem, I just I I can concentrate pretty good. So I kind of just deal with this thing, and then I just deal with doing art or the other thing often so many things happen here um and like i got projects and deadlines mm -hmm. and like sometimes stuff happens like uh, you know everyday life thing like the toilet is stuck or something like that you know what i mean mm -hmm. sometimes bigger stuff it's just like you just I just take time to do one thing and then I take time to do one thing, like 100% one, 100% the other one. I don't think about my problems while I do art, you know what I mean? Yeah, but a lot of times people, you know, they just can't help but to have thoughts that they don't want come into their head, right? Like, how do you deal mm. with those issues? I don't know. I, I think, I don't you, think... You meditate don't you i used to meditate a lot oh you don't meditate anymore hmm. i don't i didn't meditate in a while life's but good. life's good man you know? <laughs> drawing <laughs> you know to me um life drawing when i used to go to life drawing like 20 hours a week at school to me it was like meditation yeah so to me meditate like drawing and painting is a lot like meditation and when i don't know if you do that bobby but do you, do you have a voice in your head? Do you talk to yourself in your head? Yeah. Yeah. So when I draw and when I paint, um, and that's what I used to do in life drawing. Like I, I read in a Zen Buddhism book that um, meditate, meditation, and I think in Japanese, uh, like I may be wrong on this, but meditation means thinking. 
So it's not just your mind is totally empty and stuff like that. It's like thinking about stuff. So to me, drawing and painting is meditating. And uh, when I, I cannot listen, I know you listen to audiobooks often when you draw and paint, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Me, I talk to myself in my head and I'm totally deaf when I paint and draw. So um, I have full conversation with myself when I draw and paint. I put a brush stroke and I'm like, what do you think about this? And I'm like, eh, maybe, maybe it's a little too dark. And then I'm like, what about that? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's better. Maybe uh, it's better. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just like to edit my answer then. Yeah. I don't have voices like <laughs> Voice that in me. my head. <laughs> It's full on conversation. So if I have an audio books on at the same time, I, I don't hear the audio book because I'm talking with my voice in my head. And um, so to me, when I concentrate on drawing and painting, it's like there's nothing else, no other thoughts coming in my head because I'm already engaged in a full conversation with the voice in my head and we're discussing the painting I'm doing at this moment. Mm -hmm. So I don't have other talks coming in cause I'm thinking about that. Uh, Oops. I usually, if there are voices in my head, they're usually negative ones. So I try <laughs> to just block them out. Try just you punch them. <laughs> down <laughs> and then get back to work. All right, so let's go on to the next question here. So the next question says, um, this is from Monica. Monica says, to up our game as artists, we seek help from other professionals. When it, when, when it comes to your health, did you consult with uh, physiotherapists, uh, physicians, like how to take care of your posture? Yeah, uh, I think I've probably had the most problems out of the three of us for sure <laughs> i see a physiotherapist i see an acupuncturist and i see a massage therapist and that is pretty much maxing it out for me um and then when it gets warmer i do sensory deprivation tanks that's awesome wow i didn't know you do that oh dude it's so good it's so fun good <laughs> Yeah. It's so well, you know, you gotta commit to more than one time. So for those of you that don't know what a sensory sensory deprivation tank is, is like uh you rent out a room, inside the room there's a tank. There's like a pod or something like that. Uh you get inside, you're completely naked, you get inside, the water is heavily, heavily, heavily salted with uh Epsom salt, so really good for you, and you're floating right you are not even trying to float you are totally floating even your arm if you try to put it underwater you need to exert effort to keep it underwater right so you're floating there the water is body temperature so if you kind of keep still you let the waves settle you can get to the point where you feel like you're floating right it's not like lying on a bed because when you lie on a bed, your body and the mattress are pressing up against each other. This is like gravity, it has minimal, minimal effect on your body, right? And so you do this the very first time, that Epsom salt is high in magnesium and you will absorb it through your body and uh, it's magnesium is one of those things that most of us have a shortage of mm -hmm. and it's best absorbed through the skin not like eating you oh, know really? magnesium pills or anything yeah oh. it's very hard to digest so through this you get a good dose of magnesium and magnesium naturally helps you to sleep very very well mm. so the first time you do it you pretty much will have an awesome nap um, and then if you do it more and more, you can definitely start to trip out a bit, which I, you know, I've uh, felt that, <laughs> which was really cool because, you know, you turn off the lights, it's completely dark, completely deprived of, of any kind of, you know, thing that will activate any of your senses. And when nothing is activating your senses, when you don't even hear a humming noise in the air, uh, 
yeah, your <laughs> your body or your mind starts to think about things or feel things that is not there. So I started feeling like I was drifting down a stream, which I obviously I wasn't. You know, uh, things like this. It's really good if you do that and meditate inside as well. Then you super trip out and uh, you feel great at the end. That sounds awesome. Next time you're down here, buddy, we'll do it. Awesome. So you go, there's some kind of a, uh, a business that Brent, like you just go there and use yeah. their tank? Yeah, you could actually, for a lot of places out there, you can use something like Yelp, right? And just Yelp um, sensory deprivation tanks. It's awesome. How did you hear about this? I heard about it through uh, a podcast with, I think it was... Is it Joe Rogan? No. Yeah, Joe Rogan <laughs> talks about it heavily, but Tim Ferriss was the one talking about it with somebody else. I think it was like Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins, supposedly, he does... Really? He does like, uh, what's it called? Um, liquid nitrogen, like tank thing where he will I don't know how it works so please oh. don't try it at home anybody <laughs> that has a whole bunch of liquid nitrogen but he would actually like dunk himself or something like that into liquid nitrogen Is that safe? <laughs> just for like a brief second uh, okay. because um, the temperature between the liquid nitrogen and your just normal temperature mm -hmm. has such a difference on it that you actually don't have contact with the liquid nitrogen. Oh, actually, yes, I've heard of this. You kind of just stand there, and then it just like pours in, and then pours right over you, or something like that. <laughs> no, I mean like the the gas, I think. Oh. Like kind of like touches your skin. I've seen like wow. videos of that. Yeah, like they they explain it kind of like um if you've ever heated up a pan like crazy hot. Right, and you drop some water on it. The water doesn't actually spread; it just beads up mm -hmm. on the pan and just starts floating around, because the temperature is so different. Yeah. Anyways. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess let's go on to the next one here. Next one comes from Nikhil again. So Nikhil asks, "How do you remember the names of the people you meet, especially when?" you say the industry is small and you don't want to insult anyone unknowingly uh well definitely try like something that really helps is think of a totally absurd scenario that somehow relates to <laughs> the person that you're trying to remember so um for example like masse right that's not the normal typical name yeah so how can I remember Masse? Like, Masse to me is like uh, in some weird, I'm trying to think of a weird way. So <laughs> I'm not saying that your name yeah. is weird, but I'm trying to think of the weirdest way I can think about it. I think about it like uh, you are, um, you know, from down south, really small country, you know, small town country, you know, environment. And you got your, you know, accent, and you're like, "Hey, my, my, say, say, what, what, <laughs> what's going on over here?" And I don't know. And just <laughs> remember it like that. That's the first time ever. That's very creative. <laughs> so you make a story like that for yeah, everyone. Yeah, yeah, just like Masse bumbling around, just trying to say something, and she's got a cow, you know, cow, cowgirl hat on or whatever, and just going, "My, my, hey, say, uh." Where where are we going today? You know, and just think about I don't know. <laughs> it works for me. Some people like to make my name into songs, and how I tell people to remember my name is like pretend I'm like Miss A, like the letter A, or like yeah, I don't know. Some people think of really creative ways. Right on. But well, that that's really good too. <laughs> that's probably even better. Um, I don't remember songs very easily. I do not remember freaking songs lyrics, very easily yeah. or even how they go half the time, <laughs> like the melody of it. I just, I can't, I just, I don't know. I think I have something missing in that part of my brain. Yeah. <laughs> um, but another one is, so 
at Imaginism Studios, we have Guy T, which is you, Thierry LaFontaine, <laughs> otherwise affectionately known as T-Bear. And then we have Girl T. And Girl T is the event coordinator for all of the schoolism workshops. And her real name is Tantavan Changavong, right? And that's Changavong hyphen Schwartz, actually. So uh, how do you remember Tantavan? Well, if you kind of think of a tent on a van and she's crawling <laughs> out of it, you know, in the morning, you know, then you could remember her name. Okay, yeah, that's Tantavan, Tantavan, Tantavan. Anyways, <laughs> I heard a good way. Um, I was listening to one of the audiobooks, uh, How to Get Someone to Like You in 90 Seconds. Oh, right on. Yeah, a good way to remember someone's name is after they introduce themselves, say, say their name first. It's like, um, like mm. Bobby, it's it very nice to meet you, Bobby. So you like you repeat it to yourself. And yes, yes, uh, and you try to use it three times. Yeah, and then it'll, I actually, say yeah, it. I do that as well. You know, when I first meet somebody, I'll try to use their name in a sentence a couple times mm -hmm. just so I can remember it a little bit easier. Um, yeah, and the other thing that I would suggest is never pretend that you know what the person's name is when you don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's you... not a good thing. Oh, yeah. It's a bit embarrassing at the same time when you get it wrong. Totally. <laughs> the the only time I ever did this, uh, which ended up being the last time, was to you know one of one of my artistic heroes, uh, Neville Page, mm -hmm. who is a character designer on so many amazing things: Avatar, uh, Star Trek. Watchmen. The list goes on and on. And before I cry, I'm just going to stop. <laughs> but when I first met him, it was at San Diego Comic Con. And you got to realize when you have a table and it's Comic Con, you're meeting like, you know, over a thousand people throughout the weekend. Your brain is mush. Mm -hmm. And even though on any other day I would totally recognize his name, when he came by, he was wearing a Scott Robertson tag because they're like best friends. Mm -hmm. And so I never met Scott Robertson at that time. And I said, oh, you're Scott Robertson. And he's like, no, uh, I'm Neville Page. And then I knew the way he delivered it and the aura around this man. He was important, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I knew I should know who this person is, but I didn't. So I, that's the only freaking time I pretended. And I was like, oh, uh, oh, yeah. You know, and he was like, obviously he knew because I did not have practice with this kind of thing. And he was like, oh, it's okay. Yeah. And then I felt even worse, you know. I was like, no, no, no. Um, where, where, where did I know you from? And then he was like, um, you know, I've worked on Star Trek, you know, Watchmen, uh... Avatar, you know, all these things. And I was just dying, man. I was just dying. That's why I highly recommend to all y'all, just go. If they say, hey, I'm so-and-so, do you remember me? You just say, or, it, sorry, if they say, hey, do you remember me? Which, never do that. <laughs> because it's not going to be a good ending. It's <laughs> either going to be like an okay ending or like a horrible ending, but never a good one. You know, if anybody asks you that, just say, let's not play this game. <laughs> you know, because of this exact event that scarred my life. All right. You learn from, <laughs> you learn from mistakes. <laughs> totally, totally. So never again. Um, next question here. So next question says... Katie Jackson. Hey, Katie. So Katie says, I felt great finishing some characters. Then looked at uh, somebody else's art, I think Flooney's art, and uh, and felt like crap. Does this push you to work out? Sorry, just trying to read this. Okay, so it's pretty much just saying, you know, does this make you push even harder, you know, to really work on your stuff and get it even better when you see somebody else's stuff and you're just feeling like poop? Well, um, you know, for me, that just, it, it sounds like competitive thinking, 
I'm not too into competitive thinking, so I'd rather just not think about things like that. But what about you guys? Me, it's inspire me. You know, I remember Bobby way back when uh, you were my life drawing tutor, and then um, I I make life drawings that are the best life drawings I ever made, and I cannot see any mistake in it. And then I bring it to you, and then you're like, yeah okay and then you point a bunch of stuff on it and then after that i'm like wow now i look at it and i think it's crap so like there you the go, you're way, welcome <laughs> the way i see this as a good thing is that you just raise my standards mm. before that was the nicest thing i ever did and now i can see this more from a higher uh standard point of view so it's not as good as i thought it would be so um just like when katie asked um you know i don't see it as something that let me down i'm like yes i just got my standards higher so my next life drawing if i feel as good as i used to feel about them it means they're gonna be that much better so i find it inspiring when i do characters and then I look at other stuff and I'm like, man, they're not as good as those. I just, uh, to me, it's like a good thing because it means next time you're going to do some where, like, hopefully you can always find characters way better than yours mm. and aim for that and use that energy as a goal. You know what I mean? And stop instead of... Uh, Putting it in front of you to stop you, you put it behind you to kind of push you. Anita asks, or she says in the chat, well, first she says that, please tell Thierry that I missed the workshop so much, exclamation <laughs> mark. And uh, then she says the best thing to, com to do is to compare yourself now to your own stuff a while back and either feel good because you've improved or ki kick yourself in the butt to improve faster. That's really great. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I really like that. I miss Anita too. Right on, right on. So um, Megan asks, this one's a good one, this kind of applies to Anita, right? Like when you live a long way uh a long way away from your mentors, what's the best way to bug them for advice? <laughs> right, so I think uh, Anita is in good hands already because Shiri has a relationship with you, right? Like you know her, you know her personally, that kind of thing. If you're kind of just going blind, the person does not know you, you've never ever talked with this person before, and the first thing you do is go, can, how do you draw hands? I have a problem drawing hands. Can you explain that? Well, it just took you about three freaking seconds to write that email. And it's going to take somebody like me hours to write back to you and show you how <laughs> yeah. to draw hands. Now, I don't, you know, in this scenario, I don't know that person. So obviously, it's going to be much harder for me to reply. But... If you just think about, hey, give a little, take a little, but give a little first, try to add some value to people's lives and they will be much more willing to help you when you need help. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a really good advice. Right on. So let's go on to the next question here. And totally, you guys jump in anytime, okay? Um, so the next question comes from Dwayne. says, any chance of schoolism coming or workshops coming to Ozarks? I live in Springfield, Missouri. Dude, we were just in Ozarks. No, we weren't. But I don't <laughs> even, that's the first time I ever heard of Ozarks. Uh, sounds interesting. Uh, Missouri... Springfield, Missouri. I've never been to Missouri. Yeah. Um, yeah. Who knows what happens in the future, but we are definitely doing a lot of workshops. So 
if it even comes close to you totally jump on it and if you have the means I would say travel I travel all the time and you know what yeah it costs money to travel and things like that but I can tell you without a doubt it has paid me back many times over just because I'm constantly traveling const not just for my own like satisfaction in my life and stuff like that but um, in my career it's helped me so much just to constantly travel so I would say the same thing to you you know uh, don't wait for schoolism workshops to come to Ozarks um, even though who knows maybe one day we will take the opportunity now and you know try to get out to something really and that goes for everybody out there uh, once you start doing that then you would see why it's so important okay next question Log is it Logan Logan asks uh, do you think there is there isn't enough creativity in film and TV how do you feel about the overuse of cliche characters, dragons, knights, and demons, etc.? I'll let you guys, uh, what do you guys think about this? Hmm. <laughs> well, well, I don't know. What do you think, T? Well, you know, um, I don't think there's not enough creativity. There's stuff that is um, often the same. But there's stuff that is totally new and totally creative and really awesome. Mm -hmm. I think it's a mix of both. It's cool to see, like, awesome new ideas that you never thought of. Yeah. And, you know, of course, there, there's people that innovate and create those new ideas. And there's always those people on top of the wave and there's always people following and kind of doing the same thing so i wouldn't say i think there's not enough creativity i think some stuff is repetitive but there's always some new cool things that i see i think it's also pretty tough to always think of something creative and new and also i guess it's also part of like the marketing where if one thing did successful i'm, I'm just like saying this from the marketing side of view they probably repeat that and reuse that is because it was successful for people. and it works so, yeah it works so they they're just going with that again yeah. yeah and you know what i used to say all the time like su success the most uh important ingredients one is uh trying your hardest and the other one is using your common sense and now i don't say using your common sense anymore i say use your logic because the common thinking amongst the majority of the population, a lot of times it's not right, you know? It's not always right, and we have to remember that, you know? Like, there's been many things that we've learned in our schooling and things like that when I was in school that are totally not true anymore. Like, dinosaurs mm -hmm. have feathers now, you know? <laughs> things like that. Um, <laughs> And there's lots of them, lots of these kind of things. Like uh, they taught us that um, the pyramids were tombs for the pharaohs. But as we know now, no pharaoh has ever been found in the bottom of a pyramid. Yeah. So now I just say use your logic, you know. Use your logic for these things like... Um, I totally forget the <laughs> train of thought. <laughs> I was just thinking about dinosaurs with feathers. But, um, yeah, like, the thing is, now, when people are making movies, they are millions and millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. You have all these people trying to think, mm -hmm. right? And they are starting to use the common sense now. Yeah. They stop using logic. You know, because logic would dictate that you want to constantly change things. You want to constantly show people that it's stuff that they've never shown before. You want to concentrate on a good story as opposed to good eye candy and things like that. You know, and, and the big thing is, is that a lot of us, we are producing all sorts of awesome original ideas and things like that. But 
the common sense is to go with what they think will be successful, which is something that's already been done, and then kind of twist it around or make a sequel of it. Yeah. Right? So it's mm -hmm. not like we people are not coming up with original ideas. It's more like the industry's skittish. You know, they're, they're nervous about new ideas. And that's, that's the bottom line, I think. It's mm -hmm. a good answer, Bobby. Great answer. Thanks, man. Um, so let's bust through these last few questions here, okay? So, <clears throat> next question is from Billy saying, I'm doing a personal uh, visual development project, but I keep running into problems like believing whether or not this project is good enough to see it through. Do you just push through? Crappy or not? Yes, you do. You got to push through and you got to like think to yourself, even if they say no, I'm going to go past the point of when I actually believe them that this will never be made. You got to go way past that point before you decide to stop. And even if you have to stop, you have to almost like be mentally prepared that a bunch of your ideas are not going to make it all the way. Right? But it's more the idea of uh, you're going to constantly keep pushing until one of these ideas come out. Nico and the Sword of Light, same thing, right? Nico and the Sword of Light is our animated comic book that uh, we made years ago. You know, it's the first traditionally, fully animated traditional, you know, drawings comic book where every panel was animated when you touch it. Um, we worked on it for two years. When we put it out into Ether, into iTunes and App Store and all that, it didn't do well. It didn't do, do well at all for like two and a half weeks or something like that. But we kept pushing. We kept looking for blogs and things like that, people that might want to talk about it, and just did not accept no for an answer. And then, you know, I think like in its third week or something like that, it started taking off. It started taking off big time, and within a week, it was number one in its category for like over 30 countries. Wow. It, w it blew up, right? And then after that, Amazon started calling. All these producers started calling. We went with Amazon Prime to do like the binge watching, a full season, right? Create a full season, then release it. They put it on their... Um, they have a thing, so if you want to sell an idea to Amazon, they will test it with their analytics and things. And so they test. They made a pilot and they tested it. And uh, we had killer reviews. It was like pretty much five stars, which you know doesn't really happen for a pilot. But then it never got picked up, right? I don't think enough girls were looking at it or something like that mm -hmm. that was the analytics behind it or something i don't really know don't quote me on nothing but it didn't get picked up did we quit at that point no that's the point that you're looking for the point at which you would normally quit look for that point as being the marker for okay now you just got to go a quarter of the length more <laughs> to reach your destination right it's always that gem, that dream, that goal that you have is almost always lying behind that line where you would normally give up. You know, you just got to keep going. You know, uh, and long story short, actually long story long, I guess, <laughs> uh, Nico and the Sword of Light was nominated for two Annie Awards this year. You know, one for storyboarding, one for um, special production. And, awesome. And it got uh, greenlit for a whole series. 2017, June 2017, that's when we're aiming to have this, uh, the whole, like a whole season of Nico and the Sword of Light that was originally just created by four people on the weekends, right? And gets all the way to Amazon Prime, all the way into a season, all the way into, you know, talking about merchandise and things like that. It's crazy. Got to keep pushing. All right. Um, 
sorry, another long answer. But uh, so Mitchell, I'll do these real quick. Mitchell asks, "How is your hand doing? Have you recovered from your injury?" It's it's a heck of a lot better. Thank you, Mitchell. Um, now I got back problems, so I'm working on that. <laughs> uh, Andre asks. So the dollar is super expensive for my country, but I want to travel abroad to learn and take schoolism live workshops. Any idea of managing and making larger amounts of money in a sh fairly short time? You know what? I don't really like those kinds of plans, but um, you know, I'm much more in favor of thinking about the long term plan. Like, how can you how can you end up going to a, at least one workshop a year coming soon you know in the years ahead something like that um, how to make a, lo a lot of money in a short period of time those usually lead to bad roads like selling drugs yeah like selling drugs or whatever else you're gonna <laughs> sell blood or I don't know um, selling organs yeah right you're not gonna don't think long term, everybody. You gotta think, or I think, think you long term. term. Think long term. Oh my god! I was gosh. like, Bobby, wait. That's why you guys are so good to just be here. You know, not just <laughs> to have a conversation, but to catch me. And I'm totally not knowing what I'm saying. Uh, next question, Jazz. Nice, Jazz McDaniel. That's an That's awesome a nice name. name. That's an artist name, if I ever heard one. Uh, is there such a thing as overstudying? At what point should you focus on personal work and get away from personal studies? You know what? Studying, learning, uh, I almost feel like they are kind of subcategories of each other, right? Like learning is like somebody teaching you something and you're watching, you're learning, you're absorbing. Studying is kind of like when you're like, okay, I need to study the anatomy, you know, of the body and stuff like that. And I need to be able to draw it you know, from memory. Um, constantly do both of those and produce per personal art as a result of learning and studying. And I think that is the best fast track to getting crazy good, you know, and just like a, becoming a ridiculously good artist. Uh, too many people, myself included, get into periods where it's like, producing we got to produce all this stuff because we have a job or whatever it is that we need to produce the best way to get better is studying and learning uh asterisks on on both of them actually it's the combination that will make make a combustion for your skills hannah asks um and sorry, I'm just going to bust through these questions, okay, guys? Um, yeah, go for it. I'll ask this one. You guys jump in, okay? As a professional who graduated recently, do you think you should stay at a company and work your way up or move and experience different companies? So what do you think, Mr. You... <laughs> <laughs> I've only been in one studio and it's only here. Um, I don't know. I haven't had much experience yet, so... Hmm. Well, you know, I would hate to see you go. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, just kind of speaking my own mind, I think the main thing is, as long as you are constantly growing, mm -hmm. it, then it's okay. To stay, yeah. Yeah, like generally, just like what T was saying before about his jobs, you know, you want to take the jobs that will stretch you and push you further. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, you know, I did my internship at Imaginism Studio when I was in school. And uh, Kay and I, we never went back to school after that. The reason why I decided not to go back to school is because I was learning more with you and Kay than at school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel so like I think I, as long as you learn, I think you should. St I think you should go where you learn the most. Mm -hmm. Definitely, it's 
you know, it, it is a tough question because sometimes you do need to experience um, that kind of lesser experience a lot of times so that you can appreciate, you know, what you have. Like I've worked in, uh, you know, other studios before where I, I had bad experiences. So now I'm, I'm completely content. I have no kind of aspirations to work in whatever other studio because I've experienced it. But, um, you know, sometimes even if you start off at a great position or whatever, you know, it's like the grass is always greener on the other side. So in those cases, sometimes perhaps, you know, those of you that feel like that should experience those things so that you can see um, what's good and what's bad. Mm -hmm. Not you, Musse. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to mess up my whole thing here. Okay, so uh, another question here, which is uh, Anita asks, I'm about to start these comics uh, doing character design at the moment. Any advice for the first steps, especially if you're in a hurry to present your material at a comic fair? Oh, another hurry. Mm. Definitely try not to hurry. Um, you know, really plan things out for the long run. Uh, Find it, lots of references? Yeah. Because that cut down, cuts down a lot of uh, steps ahead. Prepare twice as long so you only have to draw it once, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good one. I have a painting here that's done by Nathan Fawkes of this duck. Oh, yeah. And he prepared for that painting for about 30 minutes, half an hour, like 40 minutes, 30 minutes. And it only actually took him five minutes to paint it. Insane. Um next question here so last question okay when going to conventions what do you guys think of displaying what do you guys think of uh displaying fan art versus original art pieces now there's kind of like two sides to this right t a lot of people they go oh well you know you do fan art it's almost like copping out it's almost like selling out something like that i think I think it really depends on your motivation behind it. Like, mm -hmm. I think the way you do it, Bobby, is great. Thanks, man. <laughs> like you, you kind of, it's like you don't just do fan art, but once in a while you do a kind of your own version of a thing. Yeah, it's yeah. your own take so. on that fan. I mean, that art. Yeah, which is, I think, is the best way to do fine art. Well, you it's know, like, and part of that is really like I'm doing that every kind of fan art piece I've done is because I watched it or whatever and I liked it. And so <laughs> I wanted to do something, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't like, oh, I, I need to make a print that sells or something like that. You know, the motivation wasn't that mm -hmm. um, the motivation came from an honest place. But at the same time, I do not want you know, it's totally okay either way, but I don't want people to think of my art as being nothing but fan art. I love the fact that a lot of people like the original art and sometimes, you know, a lot more than the fan art. I think it's a good place to start off if if this person, if uh, Romer is, uh, if you're starting off, um, uh, sorry. La, la, the art. conventions. Yeah, if you're going to the convention for the first time, then fan art it will attract people. Um, I think, but if you want to add original art, it's nice to like mix it in just so people will be interested and they'll ask you like, oh, what's this from? And then you can just say like, this is my original stuff. And if people are interested, they'll ask more about it. But definitely, um, I think for me, how I got a few followers or people that like my like that, you know, always come back every convention is doing fan art. And then if they like the same thing as you, they will actually talk to you. And from there, you get a fan base. And then from there on, again, you can make your own stuff. And then, you know, that's where you can kind of start off. Wonderful. Nice balance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's a 
balance. Right on. Well, thank you everybody that showed up for the stream. We had a great time. I had a great time watching uh, T Bear Paint. Um, if you want to learn from T, if you want to get real intense, the most intense thing that we do at Schoolism is the house. The Schoolism house where only four artists are accepted at one time to live in St. Julien, just, uh, just outside Montreal, Canada, where you would be living with your mentor, Thierry LaFontaine. And towards the end of your trip, we fly in a guest artist um, to teach you and to live at the house with you as well. The yeah. most exclusive, the most intense, the most serene, you know, full on experience. Yeah, it's an awesome experience. And I think right now we have April 17 to May 16 open, and we're about to close that. So you, if you guys are interested to join, it's time to send your application. Right on. And they can find uh, everything through, um, well, we'll put a link in the video when we upload this on YouTube. But if you just search up, uh, I guess, Imaginism in-house in workshop, yeah. Right now we're in the transition of changing the, the branding, the name to Schoolism House. Hope I didn't confuse anybody. It's the same thing. Okay. It's the same thing. And it's on the Imaginism website. You can also find it on Facebook. And all the awesome pictures and the awesome video we made a few weeks ago when you guys came. It's all on there. Awesome. <laughs> good times. Good times. All right, T. Got to run. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, very much. Masse, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you guys soon. The wow moment is probably when, you know, you, you start and you meet everyone for the first time, the ability to connect with each other. When I came here to the worship, it was like a huge step for me. Like, okay, I'm getting my drive back. And there was a little period where I, I found myself like what I couldn't draw the way I used to, and I was a little bit lost. And then after the second week, there was a day when everything clicked, and all the things that they were telling me kind of like made sense. And in a minute, I understood the whole thing, and that was pretty like a world moment. Like, okay, now I get it. Now I can, I can get all the stuff that they're you know teaching me, and I can tie it to what I've been doing for the last year. T is a very persistent teacher, he is very honest and I think that's what makes us grow because he's not afraid of showing what, what we're doing wrong and what we can do to improve. He's not trying to make us happy, he's trying to make us learn. So that makes all the difference for me. T has a very clear way of explaining things. When he gives us our feedback, it's just like you kind of you think that you've done an okay job and then he just takes it to like a whole different level. That's just the main crazy thing because now I can take well on the Cintiq and three weeks ago I couldn't. I, I evolved so much since I came here. It's like a boot camp where I got all the tools I need. I think that that's the most incredible thing and we've been working like this for the whole month and I feel that I improved a lot. And. So that was one of the reasons I really wanted to do the workshop. Be surrounded by art, be surrounded by other students. After this workshop and meeting other artists, you really get to open your mind to the different perspectives and the different minds and how big the world actually is. You know, someone's from Spain, someone's from Austria, Brazil, and then people in Canada. It's just crazy. This, this was the best experience I've had in education. It's like I went to college and I had to do a lot of classes that I wasn't interested in. I would do the things I was and then it's diluted in between different subjects. And, but this one, you live, you live the course, you wake up, you're in class, you're, the level of immersion is so intense that there is no way that you won't take, you, you won't learn a whole lot. It was extremely rewarding. It's definitely life-changing. I would definitely recommend this uh, workshop to anyone. I haven't been to any other school or class or anything like that where the teachers have this level. This is this is industry level. This is something that you don't get in any normal school in any way. 
So the fact that you are living with them and they're teaching you stuff day by day and they can comment on what you do, it's a big privilege, it's a big thing. It's not, you know, you don't, you don't take it for granted. It's really amazing, I really suggest it. I'm the first Colombian here, <laughs> so I'm gonna just spread the word because it's really worth it. I love that experience. <laughs> Every artist should go through such an experience. Learn uh, meeting people and getting to know other techniques and going deep into art for like a whole month. It's, it's awesome. 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 awesome.